So prokaryotic cell structure, um, this is uh, the, yeah, the structure of prokaryotes, yeah? Duh, all right, thanks. So that's really helpful, huh? Okay, sorry about that. All right, so basics and taxonomy, morphology, prokaryotic cell structures. Here we go. Any, any questions before we start? Are you guys, how, how are you guys surviving our little death march through lecture material? Okay, very good. All right, so all living things are made out of cells, as we talked about before. Cells come from other cells. Um, the cell theory was uh, uh, required a microscope to uh, talk about. The laws of physics determine that cells have to be small. The reason cells are small is because of what's called the diffusion limit. Diffusion is a, is a law of physics. It's a law of a part of physics called thermodynamics. In other words, entropy. In any case, the reason that cells have to be small is in order to satisfy what's called a surface area to volume ratio. And uh, so basically what that means is, um, well, let me, let me ask you this. Let me, let me ask you this. Um, cells are, you are made of cells, yeah? You agree? Um, what do cells need to stay alive? What do your cells need to stay alive? Oxygen. What else? Nutrition. Food, yeah? And anything else? I guess water, yeah? And then, and then maybe the ability to get rid of their metabolic wastes, yeah? So all three of those things, yeah, are, are needs of cells and needs of you, right? Your needs are essentially equivalent to the needs of your cells, aren't they? At that level. You need oxygen, you need food, you need water, you need to get rid of wastes, you need to do all those things because your cells need to do all those things, yeah? Is that clear? All right, so on how, much, how many calories per day do you guys need? About 2,000? That's a nice round number. Um, is it the, exactly the same for every one of us in class? No. So what do you think that hinges upon? How much, how much energy you use based on how much exercise, yeah, what else? Your size, your weight. So, um, so ignoring exercise, right, the fact that I no longer exercise certainly influences how many calories I need per day, yeah? Um, and if you exercise, you need more calories, and if you don't exercise, you need less. But if you ignore that, then Basically, the bigger you are, the more food you need per day, yeah? So, um, so you're likewise, if you have a big cell and a small cell, who needs more food? The big cell needs for more food, and generally, how much more food that bigger cell needs is a function of how much bigger it is, yeah? So your needs and a cell's needs are a function of your mass or a cell's mass, how big that cell is. You agree? Okay. What about how a cell gets food? You get food by eating it, putting it, putting it in, in, uh, in, in, in your mouth, yeah? Um, how does a cell get food? The cells, what do you think, cell wall? Cell membrane, right? Let's, let's be proper with the, the, the language. That language will matter once, once the quizzes come, yeah? So the barrier, this, the, the boundary of that cell, the cell membrane, yeah? You guys with me? So, um, well, what happens to the volume, uh, or what happens to the cell membrane as a cell gets bigger? Does the cell membrane get bigger? It does, but how much bigger does it get? The cell volume is how, how many dimensions is your volume? Three dimensions, yeah? We are three-dimensional beings, yeah? What about the membrane? Is it a three-dimensional structure? I guess it is, but, but 
in its operational sense, it is a two-dimensional surface. You agree? Right? So as the, as the cell gets bigger, it gets bigger with the power of cube, yeah? As the surface of the cell gets bigger, it gets bigger with the power of the square. Does that make sense? Um, so as a result, your volume gets bigger faster than your surface area. Does that make sense? You guys with me here? This describes it. Here's the small cell. It is one unit on each side. So what's its surface area and what's its volume? Its surface area is what? It's the sum of its size or it's the sum of its sides, yeah? And each side is one by one, which, which means this surface is how big? One. And how many surfaces for a cube? Six. So its total surface area is six. You guys with me? Likewise, what's its volume? One times one times one. Length times width times height. Yeah? You remember this from, from what year of math? Freshman middle school or, or freshman in high school? What a great time you had a math class back then, yeah? Raise your hand if you loved middle school math. Right? I love math. I'm just crazy about it. Kidding. I, I, uh, if you didn't love math, I was there with you not loving it. Um, nevertheless, applying math is, is critical in a lot of situations. All right. So the volume, 1 times 1 times 1, total volume is 1. Yeah? So the ratio of the surface area to the volume is 6 to 1. Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay, so what about the big cell? What's its, how big is it on each edge? Six. So its total surface area is six times six for 36 for each side, yeah, times six, which is, as it turns out, 216. I would not be able to do that in my head, yeah? What about its volume? Length times width times height, yeah? Six times six times six, which is also two, 216, yeah? So our surface area to volume ratio has gone from six to one down to one to one, right? The surface area has gotten bigger, but the surface area has gotten bigger slower than the volume's gotten bigger. The volume's gotten way bigger, the surface area's just gotten kinda bigger. Does that make sense? Guys with me? So, eventually, at some point, you can see from this, as a cell continues to get bigger, its needs, its ability, to, its needs are going to depend on its volume, how big it is, yeah? Its ability to fulfill its needs are dependent on its surface area. There's no way to get into this cell other than through the membrane, yeah? And in order to get to food to the cell, it's going to have to pass through the cell membrane, yeah? So the surface area of the cell limits how much food can get into the cell. Does that make sense? Right? So at some point, there's going to be a critical surface area that is insufficient to satisfy the needs of the volume. You agree? As it turns out, that critical point happens in the realm that we call small, microscopic. Is that clear? And that is why cells are small. They must be small because the world of the small is where the critical value of surface area to volume, the breaking point, is reached. Is that, is that good? Okay. So that's why cells are small. Okay. So kinds of cells. We already know the two basic kinds of cells. Yeah? What are they? Prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells, what? Smaller and simpler. Always unicellular. Eukaryotic cells, larger and more complex, have the possibility of being multicellular, but there's no guarantee. Okay. Is that clear? So cells, two kinds. These, these slides, as you can see, are direct, um, direct copies of slides we've seen in previous PowerPoints. Yeah? So, I keep them here because they are basically logical steps in an argument. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So two kinds of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. So here this brings up why we study cells. Why do we need to know all the organelles? Raise your hand if you learned about mitochondria and the nucleus, yada, 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 in a class before. Right? Good. I'm so glad the two of you raised your hands because I know I was the, I, I taught you guys that at some point. And maybe you already knew it by the time you came into that class, right? Why do we care in microbiology? The reason is because as we learned last week, differences in structure make exploitable targets. Yeah? Does that, does that make sense? Do you understand what I mean by this? Exploitable targets for what? What do you mean disease-wise? What do you think? Sure, what kind of disease? Diseases that affect what kind of cells? Eukaryotic cells, why? Because who do we care about? We care about us, right? You guys are in this class because you want to be nurses, right? Um, and nurses, their job is not to care about bacteria. Right? Your job is to care about people, right? Well, as it turns out, the differences between bacteria and people are exploitable targets. In other words, uh, a person who's trying to find a drug, are they going to find a drug that destroys a structure that your cells and bacterial cells have in common? Probably not. Why not? That would be, yeah, that would not be helpful because it would harm you as much as it was, was harm the prokaryotic cells. Does that make sense? All right. So, so again, the reason we care about these things is because the ways in which prokaryotic cells are different are ways that we can target with drugs, yeah, medicines to kill those bacteria, yeah? And why do we want to kill them? Well, because some of them are bad for you, right? We learned a lot in that first homework assignment about good bacteria, right? But there are still bad guy bacteria out there, right? And that's why we're in the class, really. Okay, so prokaryotes, always unicellular. They have some basic cell structures. So these structures here are common to all microbes or all cells, really, right? They all have to have a genome. They all have to have a cell membrane, ribosomes, and cytoplasm. Two basic types of cells, what do we call those? Prokaryotic and eukaryotic, that's the answer, good, good. Okay, so all cells require all of these things. A genome, that is all the DNA of any cell is the cell's genome. And so whatever cell you are, you need to have all your DNA, yeah? You need to have a division of the inside you have to way to separate what is you as a cell from what isn't you as the rest of the world, yeah? Um, a way to make proteins. How do we make proteins? We'll learn ribosomes are the thing that make proteins. And then a medium for chemical reactions to take place. Those, those things are essential for all cells. Prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells fulfill these requirements with structures called organelles. If you guys heard this term before, most of you, I believe, have. What does organelles mean? So organelle means little organ, yeah? Give me an organ. That's an organelle. I said give me an organ. The liver. There we go. What does the liver do? Say it again. Cleans out toxins from your blood, yeah. Sure. Give me another organ. Stomach. What does a stomach do? Digest your food. Breaks down your food. Yeah? Give me another one. Heart. What does the heart do? Moves the blood around. Yeah? Okay. So each of those is a discrete structure that is a, a, a structure that you can look at. Looks the same way in every person. Yeah? Roughly. Um, and has a particular job, yeah? 
and has a particular size and shape. Likewise, um, structures inside cells have particular shapes, do particular jobs in the same way that organs have particular uh, shapes and do particular jobs in, um, in human bodies, yeah? Okay, so um, some scientists say that only eukaryotes have organelles. Others say membrane-bound organelles, right? So what does organelle mean? Does it mean structure inside a cell? If, well, if that's true, then prokaryotes have organelles because they have structures, yeah? Um, but if you define organelle as membrane-bound, well, as it turns out, there are many structures that eukaryotes have that prokaryotes don't. And, and, and historically, at least, those, those were the things that were called organelles, okay? Maybe that's splitting hairs a little bit, but this is, this is a distinction some people make, but it's a semantic argument. It's an argument about the definition of the word organelle, okay? Got it? Okay, moving on. Bacterial shape and arrangement. In other words, bacterial morphology. Okay, so, in, um, so I think um, I'll just put in parentheses below here morphology. Morphology is the study of bacterial shape and arrangement. So I recommend that you make sure that you understand that term. Okay? Okay, so moving on. Um, prokaryotic cells. Their shapes generally are A, small, they're prokaryotes, yeah? About 0.2 to 1 micron big, 2 to 8 microns long. You understand how big a micron is? This little squiggle here is the Greek letter mu, and the Greek letter mu is the prefix for micro. How big is a micrometer? One thousandth of what? of a millimeter, very nicely done. How many people knew that? You should know that. If you don't, um, we can talk about it very briefly right now. Everybody show me a meter with your hands. You darn well better know what a meter is. A meter is about a little longer than a yard. So if you know a yard, do a yard with your hands and then add a little, little bit more, yeah? Tiny amount more, yeah? So that's maybe a meter. Right? What's a, what's a millimeter? That's a thousandth of this. So you take this, divide it into a thousand, you have a millimeter. A millimeter is about the distance you can hold your fingers apart without touching them and see a gap. Right? The smallest and closest you can hold your fingers together without touching them, that's about the best definition I can think of, of a millimeter. It's not take it to the bank, but it's, it gives you a ballpark figure. Yeah? Take that millimeter and then divide it into a thousand, right? Take that thousandth and divide it into a thousand. So a thousandth of a thousandth is a millionth. And that is a micrometer. Is that clear? It is a millionth of a meter. So how big are bacteria? They are two tenths to one of those thousandths of a millimeter. You guys got it? So they're really small, right? When we looked at pond water, what we were looking at it for the vast majority of people and what we saw were eukaryotic cells. Many of those were animals. Others were protists that were unicellular. But we, if we want to see bacteria, we have to use, generally, we have to use the oil immersion lens, which we did not use when we were looking at the pond water, okay? You guys with me? So these we have yet to see, and we'll see them next week. They're small. Most bacteria are monomorphic. Do you understand what this means? You probably have not heard that term before, and it's not a term I use a lot, but maybe you can fake your way into knowing or guessing what that term means. Yeah, so the answer is mono means one, morph means shape, right? Morphology is the study of bacterial shapes, yeah? Um, monomorphic means you have one shape. That means pretty much all of you, if you are a particular species of bacteria, all of you look about the same. Is that, is that clear? 
So let's see if I have pictures of bacteria, like large numbers of bacteria. I don't. Isn't that great? So let's pull that up. I feel a little embarrassed that I don't have that. We'll go to Google Image. And we'll go bacteria gram stain. So how many species of bacteria do we have in this, in this picture? We have one species of bacteria. These are called Staphylococcus, yeah? How do they look? They all look about the same, yeah? Are they exactly the same? No, nah, some are a little bigger, some are a little smaller, but they are really monomorphic, right? None of them are suddenly looking like stars. Does that make sense? None are looking like UFOs, right? They all look like little spheres, right? We look at a different species of bacteria, that species of bacteria, they all look about the same. They are monomorphic. Got it? That is not true for every single bacteria. There are bacteria that can change the way they look depending on environmental circumstances. But you get the basic idea of what monomorphic means, yeah? They're kind of boring and uniform to look at. A few can change their behavior based on environmental conditions, but most don't. Okay, so here are your basic bacterial shapes. Which one did we just see? Well, we just saw coccus, which means spherical. I think coccus means grape in Greek or something, yeah? Bacillus means rod in Greek, I think. And then, um, and then some spiral-shaped vibrio means bent, I think, or a sort, usually sort of a question mark shape. Um, spirillium and spirochetes, this depends on how many, how many squiggles they have, how many spirals they have, but they're both spiral shaped. Okay, so bacillus is the shape of the bacterium. There is, though, a, a uh, there is a qualifier, and, and this is, this slide is here to clear up confusion, but I think what it generally does is cause more confusion. So, um, bacillus versus bacillus. So, do you see how this is italicized? Why do you think it's italicized here? Because it is a genus. It is a scientific name, bacillus. Do you know any uh, bacteria that belong to the genus bacillus? How about Bacillus anthracis? That is a bacterium. Have you heard of it? That's anthrax. Bacillus anthracis is a bacterium that happens to have a bacillus shape, which is a sort of a pill shape, yeah? Looks like one of your Tylenols, yeah? Is that, is that clear? All right. But, as it turns out, not everybody in the bacillus genus has the bacillus shape. You understand? So, bacillus italicized is a bacterial genus. Bacillus not italicized, and you know what? I think I'm going to put this as lower case. Um, bacillus not italicized, that is... Um, that is a, sh a bacterial shape. Is that clear? Guys with me here? Okay, so um, not all bacilluses are bacillus genus, yeah? E. coli has this shape. It looks like a little pill-shaped bacterium, yeah? But E. coli is a gram-negative bacteria and bacillus is a gram-positive genus. So E. coli is a bacillus-shaped bacterium, but its genus is Escherichia that starts with E, yeah? You guys with me? So not all bacilli are, belong to the bacillus genus. Not all bacillus genus members are bacillus-shaped. You guys got it? You guys with me? All right. 
So likewise, um, some bacteria don't have any of those shapes. They have weird shapes, like this is called Stella, and it's a star-shaped bacteria, and I don't know why it's star-shaped. I don't really know anything about this guy other than that he was in the textbook. Um, there are halo files that are sort of cubic or rectangular shaped. They're neato. Um, there they are. Aren't they neat? Cubic shaped bacteria, star shaped bacteria. All right. So, what do we know about prokaryotes? They reproduce by binary fission. Yeah? Here's how they reproduce they have all this purple stuff. What's that? That is actually their DNA. This is their genome. And they copy their DNA, and then they pinch themselves in the middle. And that's it. Yeah? Um, there's a lot more to it. There are scientists that are still learning and trying to understand this. How do they pinch themselves in the middle? Yada, yada, yada. But the basics are copy your DNA, pinch yourself in the middle, you're done. Yeah? Ah, so um, it's, it varies from species to species. Um, do they split right down the middle? That is also something that varies from species to species. There are, protein, there are what are called motor proteins that can pinch off um, in, in, uh, in eukaryotic cells. As far as what proteins are necessary, I, again, it, it varies from species to species, and I can't rem remember for any particular species. So. I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know, um, but, uh, but, but uh, pinching your cells and forming, forming a, uh, in, in eukaryotic cells, I know actin is used. And actin is, is the same protein that your muscle, uh, muscles use. Um, I also know that, that motor proteins like actin are a lot less, or or myosin and other things. Actin is not technical. Proteins are a lot harder to find in prokaryotes than they are in eukaryotes. Um, all right, is that good? Well, no, it's not. And my apologies for not having a better answer for you. But uh, all right, so besides morphology, there's arrangement of bacteria. And those arrangements depend on division planes of individual species. Okay? You guys got that? So, um, so division planes, in other words, how bacteria um, divide. So, so um, do you guys understand what I'm saying here? Which of these? I've got A, B, C, and D, which of these has the greatest number of division planes? Can you answer? And which has the fewest? So raise your hand. Everybody, every, did you guys all hear the question? OK, now everybody think about it. I've heard a few guesses. Everybody take a second to think about it. And then raise your hand if you have an answer. Which of these has the greatest number of division planes? One guess. Two guesses. Three guesses. Four guesses. All right. That's probably good. I'll take all four. What's your guess? Greatest number of division planes? And your name is Luisa. Luisa. B. Greatest number of division planes? D, as in me, Dirk. Yeah. Most surface area. D? D. So D is the, is the correct answer. Which has the fewest number of division planes? A, B, C, or D? I would say B. Do you guys understand? So what, basically what that means is, if I have Staphylococcus, and let's compare Streptococcus from Staphylococcus. How does Streptococcus divide? It pinches itself, but it can only pinch itself down the middle, or 
down the, the vertical axis. Does that make sense? Right? And when it does, it forms two cells that way, right? And when this guy divides again, it forms another cell here to make a chain, yeah? What about Staphylococcus? Well, it can divide this way to make two cells this way, but it can also divide this way to make a cell up in this direction. Does that make sense? I guess it could probably also divide this way to make cells in this and this direction, and as a result, we get a big jumble here where we get chains here. Does that make sense? And these guys, arguably, can only divide on one side, either their right or their left. So maybe they have half a division plane compared to strep. Does that make sense? Guys all got that? It looks, it sounds, it sounds like people are, people got that based on the, the incidence of the correct answers. Good. All right, moving on. So, structures of prokaryotic cells. Um, should we take a second to uh, take a breather for a second? <sighs> I've been, I've been blabbering for a bit of time here. All right, so um, we'll stop for a second and then, and then I'll start again. Oh man, stop.